Jesus. Oh my life, Hi, it's Ruby. Ruby. Wait, just flashing some ginger beer. We are the dangerous brothers. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ben Arnold. I'm going to be hosting the show. Hello, everybody, pimps. <laughs> Oh, I've got an enormous range. I can do you Pinto without the pauses. Demanding. Swan Lake without the dancing. Egotistical. Men over 50 without the lights on. Selfish. Or I can do you a cheese board and a selection of volathon. Rude. In fact, there's nothing I can't do. Really awful jokes, saved only by the fact that he's a, a good-looking human being, as he'll be the first to tell you. My whole concept of show business has always been about dressing up and illusion and that kind of fantasy and magic, and uh, that's, what I want, that's what I wanted to do. Evening all. Very nice of you. I, I never say no to a standing ovation. I first met him ten years ago in the Edinburgh Festival and a friend of mine knew him and at the time he was performing at the festival and his rubber shorts split and at the time in Edinburgh you could not buy rubber so I repaired them with a puncture repair kit and it started from there. <laughs> it's very easy, it doesn't crease so you can keep it in the bag. You don't have to wash it, you just run it under the tap. And you used to polish it with Mr Sheen once you've got it on and um, so it was a bit of a breakthrough, you know, you, you could have this uh, glamorous outfit that was so easy to maintain. Please welcome the excellent John Collins Fan Club, let's see it. Good evening, punters. Thank you for your applause. <laughs> There's uh, nothing I like more than a warm hand upon my entrance. <laughs> <laughs> Dynasty was everywhere at that time and Joan was on every magazine cover and she used to wear, if she'll forgive me saying, rather a lot of makeup and I thought, well, I thought that would tie in with me wearing a lot of makeup. And she was camp and she was an icon and frankly I was signing on at the time and I couldn't use my own name. What's your name? Colin. Colin. Who does your hair for you, Colin? This is quite <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> was it the council? <laughs> Julian was obviously very, very different from anybody on the circuit when alternative comedy got going in the early 80s. I mean, for a start, he was coming out laden with eyeshadow and sequins, and he was very brave, considering some of the venues he had to play. Nobody else looked like that. And he was also um, getting his dog to do impressions. So, uh, quite clearly, there was nobody else like Julian. You saw him and you remembered him. A well-known, a well-known film. <laughs> That's the Dogs of War. Well, the thing about the act that Julian used to do with uh, Fanny the Wonder Dog is that Fanny the Wonder Dog was the one with the talent and Julian was very much the passenger, and anybody will tell you that he was around then in those early days. People thought that Franny was going to go on to huge worldwide domination, and but for the fact that Julian's been drugging her food, she would have done. Another, um, thank you, another well-known film. <laughs> Psycho. He's part of a very old and loved British comedy tradition that includes people like Frankie Howard, and uh, Larry Grayson and, and Kenneth Williams, who were all gay but never came out. What we were trying to do was to, I don't know, risque up mainstream television a bit. What have you bought? I've got my holiday snapshots. Oh, holiday snapshots. <laughs> How exciting. Let's have a look. What have you got? That's me. And that's me. <laughs> That's me and that's me and the boys and that's Oh, me let's and have a look boys. at you and the boys. 
when he's talking to his punters, he's, I mean, humiliating them, basically, despite what he may protest. But people don't mind that because he has a way with it and he has a very pleasant smile and you can't take offence. I went to dinner recently with Lord Longford. Um, it, oh, it's a terrible cough, isn't it? Do you hear that up there? You want to suck a fisherman's friend? <laughs> One of the whole points of, of doing a cabaret kind of show, it's not a play, you're not allowed, you're allowed to open a packet of crisps if you want, you know, you can make noise, you can have a dialogue. And, uh, and also, if you start improvising, everyone knows you're improvising, so it kind of uh, wakes people up a bit. Hello, you two a couple. No. <laughs> he seems to think you are. <laughs> I think we knew that Channel 4 may be smiling upon us and um, Paul Merton and, and I thought about what would be a, a good televisual wheeze for me and we knew that it had to involve punters so then we thought of a game show then we thought well we don't want to do a real game show so we'll do a parody of one. Oh we'll have her. on the top of that. Sticky Moments, in many ways, was a very good vehicle for Julian because he had such a tremendous trouble learning lines. We could write it down on cards for him. <laughs> Job description, it says you're a police officer. I am. I am. Police. <laughs> and, uh, have you got a shiny helmet, Tim? <laughs> You're wearing a horrible tank top, Angus. <laughs> False. <laughs> well, I think it's true, I'm afraid. The first thing to do was to create an atmosphere where Julian was at, totally at home in his world. Um, it's very important when you have a character who wears outrageous costume and wears makeup that they look normal. I mean, Julian walking down Oxford Street, where everybody would point at him and laugh. But you create a world where everything looks like Chagall and everything is kind of weird and the cameras shoot offsets and someone walks in wearing their nicest horn summer wear catalogue. They look like complete prats. Have you got little leather strips down yours? Yes, definitely. That's a little touch of class. Yes. What's, the, what's the label on here? Abici. Kabuti. Concept design. Oh, yeah. What concept is this? <laughs> There'd never been a game show done before where the audience had been totally snatched from the queue outside, and that's what we did. Hello, Ronan. You're all right. right. You're Fine. a bit of a quiver, aren't you? <laughs> right. And um, if you could have anything in the world, it would be houses everywhere, all round the world. Yeah. Right. And then <laughs> people could come and visit you, couldn't they? <laughs> if you made them. They were scared out of their minds. I mean, they, they thought they'd come to watch the show, and ten minutes later, they're on stage. Gloucester, Leicester, Mike Smith. <laughs> What's the connection between those? They're all counties. They're all counties. <laughs> now, I'm sorry, but they are all cheeses. <laughs> Slight shock tactic on the audience is making them feel a little bit unsettled, but then he would be immensely warm the next second and pull them in. It's a lovely act. Julian clearly, of course, was a good signing for Channel 4. I mean, he was, again, he was completely unique, um, borrowing on a huge um, tradition, perhaps, of, um, of of gay comedians throughout the years. But, but the difference with Julian was that he, he, he was actually coming out and seeing it, and so it was, it, was, it was sort of, I was going to say in your face, but I'm not sure if that's the right expression. True or false, Patrick Fitzwilliam. <laughs> False. <laughs> oh, you obviously know William better than I do. And I do like innuendo, and uh, and I do think of it all the time. But also, just because I'm around, people see innuendo where there isn't any sometimes, so people making up their own jokes. Cupid, Jason, draw back your... <laughs> Cupid, draw Arrow. back your... Arrow. <laughs> bow. Oh, wow. Yeah, bow. They thought I was going to say foreskin. 
he has a style which always shocks you. Well, the one thing is for certain with Julian is you never know what you're going to get. He's still, um, he's still a troublemaker. I think the, the, the infamous joke about Norman Lamont is no accident at all. Please welcome Julian Clary. <laughs> Julian walked in and we were not ready, and the public, we were not ready. We were sitting in a very straight, heterosexual, normal world. I had a boring evening, um, which is always a dangerous time. In any comes, he makes this incredibly rude comment, which we know is not rude, because we're used to it. I had too long to think about what I wanted to say, or, or not long enough, maybe. And uh, that's what, that's, that was my thinking before I, before I said it. As a matter of fact, uh, I've just been... Are we still on? It was late at night, it, you know, it was fine. I've seen far worse. And I've seen, f I, you know, that since then, there's been far more offensive stuff on my television. But it doesn't involve jokes about fisting. I felt like I was being told off and I'd been a naughty boy and so I didn't, I wasn't able to enjoy the kind of notoriety of, of it. I didn't, I felt I had my legs slapped, you know. It was a tremendous shock for him at the time. It meant that to all, all intents and purposes he had to go to Australia to work and yet I think that was one of the most important things that happened to him in his career. It's just that thing being taken out of context and I think it got blown out. And unfortunately, you're terribly sorry about it. And, and hopefully, um, it's forgotten eventually. <laughs> Now, I'm going to be a sort of new age Fanny Craddock. <laughs> we want you to be my Johnny. <laughs> now, hangovers. When you wake up with something throbbing on your forehead, <laughs> thank the Lord and get on with it. Last night, whilst out on patrol, I apprehended the accused around the back door of the Food R Us supermarket. My Lord, I'm sure that all of us at some time or another have found ourselves hanging round a tradesman's entrance. <laughs> I don't know that, you know, staying in the closet was an option, really. Certainly in terms of, of the act, that was what the act was about. So um, I had to talk about anal sex constantly in order for, to have anything to say, really. And uh, I don't think many people were going to believe me if I'd said, you know, that I was straight anyway. And it wasn't an issue at home for my family. I wasn't... Uh, banished or anything. I'm the oldest, um, and then comes my sister, who's two years younger than me, and then Julian, two years younger than my sister. So there's three of us, two girls and a boy. I think I was camp as a child. I think I, I come from a very camp family, if they did but know it. Um, it's the earliest known photograph of me, and um, interestingly, I've got my legs in the air. He was a very quiet, tranquil person. He, as a child, he, I can remember always having arguments with my sister, for example, as girls do. And he'd, um, he'd come in and say, oh, please, please, let's just not, please don't fight. Please don't raise your voice. He didn't, and never, I don't think I've ever heard him raise his voice. Not very, very angrily. Never, never. My jean shrimped in phase, honestly. I can remember very vividly when he uh, was uh, running around the living room with, with veils around him and wafting and, and saying, look at me, I'm being a, an angel or a fairy <laughs> or whatever. The old brand the guinea pig. She was given a very elaborate funeral <laughs> in Teddington in the back garden when the time... She died of cystitis. Camp comedy. Um, my mother in her Minnie Mouse shoes. I'm sure those skirts were very fashionable at the time. June has always been extremely close to my mother, always. All his life, as a very small child, and now he, 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 I don't think a day goes past where they don't speak on the phone. Apparently I was quite a nice child, and she used to sing to me all the time. Early attempted at cruising. If he'd been a bank manager, or whatever, it might have been covered up. He might, he might uh, I don't know. But because he was so uh, over the top 
with, on his on it, it was, made it really easy for him. I think, uh, for, for, certainly for Julian, and I think in a way it made it easier for my parents. But it, a lot of people ask me, how do your parents feel because he's so outrageous on 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 stage, with his dress code and everything, and. Uh, well, I, they don't have much of a choice, do they? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Have a lovely holiday. Thank you. Bye, Bye -bye. sir. Bye-bye. Go straight through. Julian's of the same generation as me, and I think his work does come out of a London at a very particular time. There was um, trying to dress up as a new romantic, um, going to Susie Sue concerts, and then there was Bronsky Beat and there was Boy George. Well, we're talking about the 70s, and I guess um, the things we were interested in um, were people like Aretha Franklin and Patti LaBelle. They were into dressing up in a major way, certainly Patti LaBelle was, uh, and all that kind of space age stuff and David Bowie and Mark Bolan were around. And then I had all the influence of my sister with her. And she had, she had feather burrs hanging up in the wardrobe, which was quite easy to just go and borrow for a, an evening's performance. It says here, Mr. Nice Guy, is Roger Whittaker the most popular singer in the world? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think not. <laughs> Prior to that, when I was getting, say, two bookings a month on the circuit, that wasn't enough to survive, so I had to do singing telegrams. Sometimes they were fine. It, it would depend where you were going. But I think they did um, teach you to be a bit fearless. Um, you turn up at a pub in the East End and, and you have no idea of how you were going to locate your victim. You knew it was Debbie Smith, who was 21. And there was nowhere to change, so you had to go to the toilet and put your Tarzan costume on and hide your clothes above the cistern, and then just go out with your banana tucked into your G-string and say, is Debbie Smith here? I'm looking for Debbie Smith. I didn't know Julian when he first invented his stage act, but I did see him, and I was writing it bits and pieces for him when he was uh, Gillian Pieface, who was uh, an agony aunt. And uh, I think a lot of what we see in Julian's act today was introduced in, in that act because he used to get women's handbags out of the audience, even then in the early 80s, and pick up their diaries and read them. This is your handbag here, is it? <laughs> On your lap there. And what's the bin liner doing down there? <laughs> Sorry? You got the Mac in the bin liner? <laughs> Can I just ascertain? <laughs> I always think real people are far more interesting than, than anything that's, that, that's being acted out or recreated. So when I'm doing live shows, I'm much more interested in what's going on then. Four seasons. Oh, you're 16. <laughs> I was going for a handbag um, somewhere in Hammersmith, and th this woman had not just a diary, but a whole sort of um, A4 size book, and she'd opened her heart to this book. And uh, it was all about her, her boyfriend who was sitting next to her. And uh, she thought he was gay, and, uh, and so did I, frankly. And I started reading bits out, but I could see the whites of her eyes, and that I... so it became a little secret between me and her. And so I was able to just close the diary and say, you know, I think you're right to her. I, I really enjoy this part of the show. This is where everyone starts to relax. <laughs> the audience is all kinds of people. One of my many pleasures in life is standing on stage and seeing little old ladies and then always a couple of men with moustaches and uh, a lesbian. And then there's a little family group and uh, I like seeing that cross-section. <laughs> Oh, you're a bit of a mess, aren't you? <laughs> you just come off work or something. Lots of comedy is about slagging people off and achieving victory over people who need to be brought down a peg. And um, I'm afraid it's men we're talking about. He's going to pick on the guys. And it's funny. And I think it's hilarious. 
I, th I think sometimes we're in the minority, yes. I mean, I went to, the first time I saw him at a theatre was when I was 13, and uh, he said to me, uh, what's your name? I said, Stuart. And he says, you're very young, aren't you? And I said, yes. Uh, he said, how old are you? I said, I'm 13. He says, you probably won't understand many of my jokes, but I'll fill you in later. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what a lot of people don't realise about Julian, of course, he gets a huge amount of fan mail, obviously. Uh, a lot from women who, who are asking desperately, you know, he's not really gay, is he? You get a lot of that going on. He's under, underpants sent the whole lot, you know, because he's a very good looking boy, obviously. I was just ironing one night and I put the television on and I was just mesmerised. I'm just waiting for that moment to see him and he walks on and you're just completely taken by him, yeah. I think I'm in love with him. I mean, his audience is, is very largely female these days. And I think it's the fact that possibly because he Obviously, there's the innuendo and the, the gay side of things, but he's getting back at men. Andy, good to see you. Well, I think heterosexual men become the enemy, and uh, and all the evils of the world can be put down to heterosexual men, and it's something that I'm aware of. And um, women are a kind of minority group, and they're aware of that as well. So there's that there's that kind of bond, I suppose. I've had a hell of a day. I woke up this morning, a couple of tarts in my bed from last night. Well, I gave him one, told him to bog off, went down the pub, had a few, threw up, met a scrubber in the car. So he gave her one twice, came back here, had a rap with this bloke, laid him out, laid his bird, in, out, in, out, threw up, had a car, he gave the car, and came down here. The, this American friend of mine, uh, she lives in this country, and um, she's a, a very religious lady. And uh, one thought that she might perhaps be a little bit shocked. I mean, for instance, she's against women priests, let alone homosexual priests. Can I interest you in one of my cheesy balls? <laughs> <laughs> she did. She came to the show and she sat there with me, with my wife. And uh, they came down to hospitality afterwards, met Julian, and, um, you know, she was bowled over. She, she was... Just, again, she was just taken by the man's personality. Well, oh, sailor. I'm not a sailor. I'm the representative of the King of Spain. I'm Don Juan. I'm one, too. Well, I think he's put the cause of homosexuality back a hundred years. Easily. If not further. Huey. Not too late, am I? Oh. <laughs> just look at this big spread. Do with something hot inside me. Mmm. Full as an egg. Well, I try to offer escapism. So um, if people use it as escapism, then that's that's fine. That's using it for the purpose for which it was made. But my favourite feature is the mini bar and B day combined. <laughs> so, I don't know if you've ever had a buck fizz up your jack seat. <laughs> It's all true. Everything I say on stage is all true. It's not exaggerated or snowballed at all. <laughs> I think what he's done for the homosexual community is fantastic. I mean, I, I, you know, he, yes, he has made it much more acceptable in all parts of the country. And I know that people will now be throwing bricks at the TV screen saying, how can you say that? But it's the truth, you know. Own up to it. This um, was and still is in many ways a very bigoted society against all minorities. Probably didn't mean to, that probably wasn't why he did it, but he has changed that and he does get letters and visits from people who say, you know, I'm like you, I grew up a very lonely teenager and I thought I was the only one and I was desperate and I saw somebody like you being stylish and being funny and having earned the right uh, to have a career in prime time television. Get off me, you brute! <laughs> it's an odd feeling sometimes to see somebody on, on television. You see hundreds of people on television and suddenly you see your own brother there. And it's a very odd feeling. But it's, it's a sort of pride wells up from inside. Yes, I'm very proud of them. Very. Uncanny. Unnatural. Uncanny. That's what I am. Unnatural. That's what I am. Uncanny. That's what I am. It's choreography. That's what I am. 
Now I'm happiest when I've got a great big 